Now it's my great pleasure to introduce a very good colleague and friend, um, Dr. Gary Foster. And I don't know how I introduce you, Gary, um, but I think of a story, um, and it, it relates back to over, probably over 20 years ago, Gary rang me on a Saturday morning as I was preparing to play cricket. And um, I'm a bit of a cricket tragic. And, um, and I was captain at that time, and I took this call, and I was all focused on the game, and Gary said, uh, I'm doing my PhD on uh, men and uh, childhood sexual abuse and sexual violence. I hear you're doing the same. And this started a relationship and connection with Gary um, that's been you know, absolutely fantastic in, in promoting this issue, having solidarity together and working together for a common cause. And um, Gary's work um, here in Brisbane and nationally has just been sensational in what he's been able to do, uh, promoting Living Well, his involvement internationally, and his involvement in offering men really practical steps. So I'm looking forward to Gary's presentation. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Patrick. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the um, traditional owners of the land, past, present and future, and also like to acknowledge uh, those present in the audience um, and honour the courage of those present who've been sexually abused or sexually assaulted. Um, I've um, got a task, apparently, to do in the next 30 minutes, gender, sexuality and trauma-informed responses. <laughs> I could do a day on each one of those in relation to sexual abuse. Um, so I will try to not just skate over, but maybe you know, pose some good questions. Um, the conference we deliberately, or the symposium we deliberately um, called Confronting the Complexity, because we wanted to kind of just not say what we'd say every time or we write in a sort of nice paper, but sometimes to pose some questions or, or challenge us and others around that. Um, there's a quote up there um, which is about uh, working with men and, and sexual abuse. And I think, you know, starting with uh, what Judy is saying, you know, there's many similarities, many common, common, commonalities um, with women who've experienced childhood sexual abuse or sexual assault. You know, 80% things might be the same, but also there's some, some differences. And when you're looking to respond to people appropriately or look at the particularities of the difficulties that people experience, it's that 10, 20% you should pay attention to. Because if you're not paying attention to that, you, the, the people won't engage. They, 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 they think, I'm not talking to me. They give me a kind of general kind of response. But if you can connect with that particular experience and understand those, that's when we start to get down to really supporting, assisting people. So uh, I want to acknowledge the fact of the history of sexual abuse, or responding to sexual abuse and sexual assault has been uh, with, in the women's movement from the 1970s and 80s in developing uh, community-based services. Um, and so not, it's, not, not, you know, it's not a surprise then that really the, you know, the, the main victim that we've seen as the, the victim of sexual abuse and sexual assault at that time has been the female, female victim. And we understand completely that women are more likely to be sexually abused as children and more likely to be sexually assaulted as adults. I, I want to acknowledge that. One of the challenges is in that transition to kind of improving responses to men. Uh, and Judy said about you know, the law changing where rape has been acknowledged. It was actually 2000 in this state that the law changed. Um, but also on the, on the left hand side there, there's a, there's a, this is from the forensic medical examination of um, if you're doing to a research that somebody's made an allegation that this is the childhood sexual abuse figure, there's actually a, a larger figure for a, a adult sexual assault and it's again a female figure. You may or may not be able to see up the top left hand corner it says for male patients alter sketch appropriately. This was a forensic medical, if you'd been raped or sex yourself up until 2003 in this state, that's what the doctor would have opened when he looked to do the forensic medical examination. So there's a practical demonstration of how, in a sense, there was an absence of, uh, you know, the acknowledgement that males would be sexually abused. This, this quote here from this man, it clearly puts a front and centre, which other, other people have mentioned, you know, David, Judy, Patrick, and other people will mention the issue of uh, gender as being key here. And there is something to say here about the fact of the gender, because there's something about, you know, the women's movement were very good about collecting and coming together and sharing, supporting each other in the experience of sexual abuse. Susan Brown Miller's book, Against Our Will, 
yeah, really named this problem. Um, and that was in 1976. What people don't realise, actually, there was a chapter on uh, rape of men in prisons in that book as well. Um, but what has happened with the, with the men's movement around gender and, and, and masculinity is the fact that where women share the same experience of being oppressed by masculinity, this is Brown Miller's thesis, by, by men, and so they share the same experience. And so, in a sense, we want to change the gender order where women are low, lower down or oppressed by men and they're raped, then that confirms them in that, that unequal gender order. So that confirms them as women being sexually assaulted. I understand that's offensive, and of course I'm not saying that. Um, but if a man's sexually assaulted, it doesn't confirm him as a man. In our gender order, it confirms him as not a man. So gender is front and centre when we're talking about sexual abuse of males, just as it is front and centre when we're talking about sexual abuse of females. Uh, I'm going to uh, now play a short, short thing. It's from a film in 2013, 14. It's an American again, but it does it better than stop anybody else. Stop with the tears. Don't cry. Pick yourself up. Stop with the emotion. Don't be a pussy. Don't let nobody disrespect you. Be cool and be kind of a dick. Always keep your mind. Nobody likes a tattletale. Bros come before hoes. Don't let your woman run your life. You bit. What a fag. Get laid. Do something. Be a man. Be a man. Grow some balls. The three most destructive words that every man receives when he's a boy is when he's told to be a man. We've constructed an idea of masculinity in the United States that doesn't give young boys a way to feel secure in their masculinity, so we make them go prove it all the time. Within their peer group culture, each of them is posturing based on how the other boys are posturing, and what they end up missing is what they each really want, which is just that closeness. In good times, guys are like really close to each other, but when things get a little bit worse, you're on your own. From middle school, I had four really close friends. But once I kind of went into high school, I struggle finding people I can talk to because I feel like I'm not supposed to get help. Our kids get up every morning. They have to prepare their mask for how they're going to walk to school. A lot of our students don't know how to take the mask off. What is it you don't let people see? Almost 90% of you have pain and anger on the back of that paper. If you never cry, then you have all these feelings stuffed up inside of you, and then you can't get them out. They really buy into the, a culture that doesn't value what we've feminized. If we're in a culture that doesn't value caring, doesn't value relationships, doesn't value empathy, you are going to have boys and girls, men and women, go crazy. I had anger issues in high school. I felt like an outcast. I've been suspended at least once every year I was here. We would just look for trouble and just like try to fight. Boys are more likely to act out. They're more likely to become aggressive. Most people miss that as depression or see it as a conduct disorder or just a bad kid. I felt like just giving up on life. You know, I actually had suicide thoughts in my head at sixth grade. I felt alone for, for a long time. And I actually thought about killing myself. So man up. Man up. Man up. Act like a man. Be a man. Be a man. For my kids, I was going to end this hyper masculine narrative here. So, one of the challenges here is the fact that that wasn't about sexual abuse of boys. It's not about sexual abuse of boys, but that was about, in a sense, of what the culture that men grow up in. So, given they've had the experience of being sexually abused or sexually assaulted, to live in that culture, one of the problems is we can often see all problems for men who have been sexually abused in relation to the sexual abuse and try and resolve it, or even talk with the man who carries that story, the reason why I can't measure up, the reason why I'm so isolated, the way I'm feeling so alone, is all because of this sexual abuse, and so I've got this even greater weight to carry. Other men are, are, are getting through this all okay. What that video shows, that short segment there, shows there's the challenges for, for all men in relation to this. And we have to be careful about when we're intersecting and make sure when we're talking with guys, we start to deconstruct this masculinity. Because we don't. It's always about him having to do this work against this kind of larger or oppressive system. Now, I know I've got the pictures of Arnie, and it's kind of funny in a sense. But you know, the one that guys measure themselves is the Arnie on the left, not the Arnie on the right. The list there, you know, that's a kind of common list for guys. And what I'd like to say about that is there's nothing wrong with many of those things, all right? And it's really good for guys to be able to step into that space. And we don't want to take any of all of that away 
because if we just and without replacing it with something else or adding to it. Now, I, I, people know I have a history of being a policeman in the UK. When I was, you know, doing jobs, I was in a particular space. If I could step into that space and do my job, and that was that was a great place to be. I mean, I got stuffed it down. I got on. I made sure people were safe. I took the action I needed to do. However, if I wore it 24/7. If I try to interact in relationships in that way, I'm not going to have good, healthy relationships. I'm going to struggle. But also for guys who've been abused, it further isolates them. Because one thing that men are not meant to be is a victim. They're not meant to be vulnerable. And there's an added one here. It's not that you're not meant to just be vulnerable, but if shit happens, you're meant to be able to cope with it. You're meant to be able to get on in life, manage things for yourself. So there's a double whammy that guys, guys have, and that, that picture there is from uh, Living with a Black Dog. People know it's a great book about depression. Now you look at that and you see kind of, oh yeah, we all know what that means. But if somebody said, come on, be a woman, woman up, it doesn't make sense, but we know what it means around being a man. Yeah? And we've got to think about that, and we all have a role in this, and it's not about, you know, let's not, you know, one of the things you can do, you know, that video, there was homophobia in there, there was uh, misogyny in there and things like that, but there was also vulnerability in there and the difficulty of acknowledging speaking up about that. And that's one of the challenges. To create that space, we need to, in, in some ways, the, mo the men speaking up around sexual abuse are taking apart dominant masculinity from the inside. They are doing things that, in a sense, when we try and buff it up and saying, you know, it's unequal relations with women, and clearly it is, and we need equality, we're kind of buffing her up again, and the guys just step into the stronger space, and they do their men's rights movement stuff and all that sort of thing. That's not a good space. That's a kind of conflictual space around the gender order. What men are doing around this is they're taking it apart. The challenge is, we need to remember, is all those things, those men's health, and this is International Men's Health Week, all of those things, these guys, you're asking them to go to you know, access support and services when we're kind of aware already, they've got lower knowledge and awareness of mental health, less likely to go to the GP, lower mental health literacy, poorer diet and nutrition, greater use of tobacco, drink and drugs. So, so you know, guys using drink and drugs, five times more likely, guys who abuse five times more likely than general population, it's not surprising. Guys stepping into you know, use of violence or something like that, it's not surprising, that's the violent culture they, they, they're in. Um, and high suicide rates, you know, the, figures, the figure that Patrick doesn't say that his studies talk about is 46% of the men would have attempted suicide at some time. 46% attempted, and that figure Patrick said was 26, that was in the press that was released in, the Ju in July of that year. Actually by Christmas I identified 34 boys from two schools who had been sexually abused by two uh, priests at those schools had committed suicide. And there was another 40 boys that had been identified and abused in that context. It's just a serious public health issue, it's a serious men's health issue, but it's not been on the public agenda. We know, and, and you guys can have the sl slides afterwards, we know that designing responses uh, to men's health has really been saying you need to start actually talking to men in the language they, they engage with, to have practical resources with pictures of men on them and about other guys saying that this stuff works. It's about uh, providing services for guys that are open in the evenings. They recognise there's a window period when men might come forward. And if you, if you haven't got kind of your best workers on the phone ready to some kind of support or just, you know, invite them in the door. And that takes, can take a long time to, to do that. Then you're going to lose these guys. They might step in and then step back. And, you know, nobody's saying it's easy. We have guys who might engage us by internet, might disappear for a period of time, might telephone us, and then they might come back. They might drive to us, sit in the car park, and then drive away. It it's, it's requires active work by us to make this happen. We know also as around men and sexual abuse, and you know, I'm not going to read this, we have the practical information that also says that you, know, you, can, you can live a full life, that gives a bit of hope, because why the hell would I open up all that shit without knowing something good's going to come out of it? That goes from beyond the kind of moment of cathartic release, because there's something, you know, that's, that's, that kind of gets you, there's a moment there, but then also what you've heard, and it, we've heard it a little bit from the, about the Royal Commission. The guys say, I did it, it was good, it was fantastic to be supported, but I'm still left with all this crap. And that's the, the extra step, that's the beyond the believing and listening, that's the work that needs to be done. Uh, we know also that, know that men um, actually who've been sexually abused prefer to talk with women, often about 60, 70 percent. Because 80 percent of them would have been abused by males. So it's not surprising that they see that they want to talk with women, uh, you know, women counsellors. But we also know that it's not a kind of hard and fast rule. 
the important thing is to give them a choice. Do you want to talk to a man or a woman? Because we know actually that around men like talking with women are a bit more around relational issues, trust issues, but with guys they like talking a bit more about masculinity, about sexuality a little bit more. So it's not hard and fast. Um, we need to recognise that not all men are the same. And this is where we're really failing at the moment, because we're just trying to get ahead around a generic response for men who've been sexually abused. We haven't really got ahead around men with a disability. Now, we um, recently did 34 uh, Auslan tapes for guys trying to reach out, because there hadn't been those tapes for anybody around sexual abuse and sexual assault. Uh, the, the deaf community, uh, for women, it's three times, uh, sorry, twice as much uh, if, if they're sexually abused as a child, and for men, it's three times as much. About 50% of them are sexually abused as children. That's international studies. In the, in the generic learning difficulty community, it's 70 to 80 percent plus. People will, some will not give you figures, it's so high. And the place you go for to support port is the very place you're most likely to be abused. We know that in the Aboriginal and uh, Torres Strait Islander communities, it's very high. But we've got to be careful about poverty and people moving through the house. And about the, about, but again, it's where's the support? So this list here almost is the list of people where it's most likely to be sexually abused. Yeah? And they're the ones we haven't even got near to in the sense of designing specialised responses for that group because it is important. You know, we're just hearing conflict and post-conflict zones. They're really important things to look at. What we know around them is that um, the, the, the World Health Organisation and the UN to date has, has done reports on torture and trauma. And when they've talked gender-based violence, they've talked of it in that way. What they've started to now look at and say, well, let's actually name the gender as the rape of men, not just torture. So we've kind of had this hidden figure of in the refugee camps and the abuse around that, because it's been named as torture and trauma rather than the sexual abuse. And the large number of men in Central Africa are being raped, in Bosnia that were raped, in Syria that have been raped, in a sense, and the children and boys that have been raped in those conflict zones as well. We're only starting to look at that. We know transgender people, 50% report being sexually assaulted. We know the gay community, one in five report being sexually abused. As a child. We've got to be careful around that because is that a willingness greater to come forward and speak around this issue? Because they've identified the difference between consent and non-consent. Because they've come out and already addressed the issue of homophobia. Sexuality is an important issue because of that stuff around guys. Because the fact of the majority of male sexual abuse women, they're confronted by this question around, you know, will people judge me? So as long as there's homophobia and heterosexism, you're going to stop men coming forward. We can do all this institutional change. We can have really good support services. But if a guy's worried that you'll think he's gay and judge him, or that he is gay and thinks he won't get a good service, he's not going to come forward. So equality is really, really important. Dealing with homophobia is really important. But it's also dealing with the intricacies of this, of recognising that for, for guys who have been abused, they don't just wonder whether people are judging. They go, am I really gay and I don't really know it? Maybe the offender thought something. Maybe I didn't enjoy this woman sexually abusing me because that's because I'm gay. Maybe I'm actually gay and I'm really gay only because this guy kind of turned me out to make me gay. So females are sexually abused. Nobody asks the question of, are you straight because 96% of you were sexually abused by a male? Nobody asks that question. But we do ask that question to boys and it, and it worries them profoundly. And we have these ideas about latent homosexuality and, you know, my erection means that I'm, that means it's desire. You know, we've got Lacan and Freud on that one as well. Um, but one of the challenges around that is recognising that the physiological response and getting good information out there about the fact of this is a pressure on the prostate can produce a physiological response. And also recognise that offenders, for, sometimes for their own good, will go, I'll configure this as a consensual relationship. I'll work on this so that he ejaculates. Not just to keep him quiet, but I feel good because then I can say it's an equal relationship. So we need to talk about these matters, about sex, about erections and those things. And also disavow this whole thing about um, you know, the latent desires, which is an invention uh, of 1898 by a man named Thuano, who had to explain that, well, how come men were coming out later in, in life, so there must have been uh, this thing hanging around. Often men will know. You know, they, they don't talk about that question about just learning. One of the changes around that is how we respond to that. Do we start joining, well, let's talk to just about equality, or do we start to think about you know, the broadening stuff, the queer movement, the fact of choice? One of the challenges, we get caught up with identity politics. And when we do that, we don't look at the process and the choices. So one of the challenges of the Royal Commission is so many people got away with abusing because they were this, they were a good priest and they were a good person, or they were doing this because of their identity around this. Or, in a sense, for this stuff, you can get caught up with, is a person gay or straight? 
or is, are, are they homosexual or heterosexual and spend our time worrying about that. Well, if you put all that one side, then all you have, the question is, is this consensual between the person who can consent or not? When you move the gender, it doesn't matter if it's a male or a female homosexual, the question only is about whether this is consenting sex and the adult is able to make the choices around that. So that's a really important issue. So we have to watch out for the kind of identity politics where we kind of miss the responses that we need to do. Um, looking at time, I'm going to do it. We've got trauma-informed responses. What we know about Briere, uh, and I'll try not to hold you back. So Briere is really, really good. It's page 78. He talks about the fact that if we know more people are sexually abused in different groups, we need to make sure we have trauma-informed care. We've got the great piece of work by ASCA around guidelines for working in this area. What Briere doesn't do, for the rest of the another 150 pages in his book, is he doesn't say, what we're going to do, we're going to work with men. What are the challenges? And that's the bit we're now stepping into. And that's where, professionally, all of us need to start kind of documenting, make sure we, we address those issues. One of the challenges, we've got the PDSD thing. I'm going to flip through this really quick. We recognise now that a much better one to look at is through complex trauma. One of the challenges around PDSD is it, it kind of works, and historically it's come out of you know, uh, Vietnam and other places and doing this research. It's kind of good where if I'm an adult and I've already had a sense of self, and something happened and then now I'm not going down that street anymore, I'm feeling anxious and I'm avoiding things and I'm having triggering memories. That kind of works as a kind of model to deal with it and to address it. But complex trauma is completely different because this happened at a developmental age. So who am I is a really big question. I've not got this kind of sense of who I am to go back to that I can build on. So complex trauma is a much better way to understand this. Now, that when we think about that as a phasal response and about how we're going to do that in a, a, you know, the classic trauma-informed framework, we need to think about safety, stabilisation and engagement. And that's all key. The Courtois has really added the engagement. I would put it up front because that's something you do all the time. But processing of traumatic memories, that's not the end point. It's about sense-making. And this is very clearly come through with guys. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about that. So engagement, we need to recognise every single session, every time we have a conversation with somebody, it's about engagement. Yeah, we need to be thinking, we don't need, you know, somebody's got a foot halfway out the door, and this is particularly true with guys. Uh, Brea talks a little bit recently about using motivational interviewing techniques as a really useful way to make sure somebody's continually motivated, because it's about them. It's not about, if it's about, I just want to stop these memories, that's very discreet people work, and that doesn't really make, get people motivated. It's about me living a good life. That's the kind of motivation we should be looking at. I, I won't go to that one. That's safety and stabilisation. We talked basically about some of the guys, because we don't go to hospitals or whatever, doctors, something like we just appear in crisis. We've got no kind of resources. We've got, you know, probably drink drugs, popping pills, everything like that. And it's about how do you respond? We need to recognise the safety and stabilisation that these responses, guys will respond in a particular way to those and they'll feel out of control because there's a guy meant to be in control. That's a real challenge. That one down the bottom, when people do the fight, flight, freeze one, people often do the fight, flight, they don't talk about the freeze. The one that completely dud guy's head in is freeze. Because if I fought, I can say I'm a man, I fought. If I tried to run away, I can say I ran. But if I froze, then what does that mean? Did I agree to it? Was I involved in some way? Maybe I'm gay, all those sort of things. So we need to give guys information around that. We need to look at men's relationships with their bodies because we know that in a sense, as a guy, you're meant to you know, just man up, stuff it down, move on, mind over matter, all those sort of things. So we're almost being disengaged from our bodies. You know, anybody who's done you know, exercise, you just push through, go through, no pain, no gain, all those sort of things. Well, fortunately, there's some good changes coming around that. And, you know, even those who do the gym thing, you'd notice people do a much more kind of fluid movement now, um, and it's less discreet. But the things like yoga and tai chi, Professor van der Kott, when he was over here a year ago, spoke about how they're getting just as good results as CBT as when young people who've experienced trauma do yoga. Because it's about integrating mind and body. It's about building that connection and being able to sit with stuff in a really in, in, in a useful way. We know around men's emotions, you need to expand their emotional vocabulary. Of course we can feel, of course we have these range of emotions, but if the language is, is there only mad, bad, glad, sad, or that we can only talk about anger or express anger, then that's where it's all going to get funneled. So giving people, you know, a field of feelings, giving them lists to look, you know, there's frustration, there's annoyance, there's aggravation, there's, there's absolute outrage, and there's absolute rage, and then there's anger. And there's a difference between anger and aggression. Talking about emotions with guys is really, really important. 
And we all develop, is develop from having good emotional responses. We've got to watch out for the kind of emotional regulation response, because it's almost like if I've, I've been trained to be quite hypervigilant because of the sexual abuse and sexual assault, one of the challenges for me is that, you know, I'm spent, I could be trained by these counsellors to be really vigilant around my emotions all the time, and I'm, I spend all my time kind of managing my symptoms my whole life. That's not a good way to do it. So some of the new work around emotional tolerance is really, really good. Mindfulness is really good, uh, and breathing exercises, they've been useful for guys, because I want to sometimes be able to just stuff, stuff it up, down and get on. I want to have this strong sense of myself as somebody who can manage stiff stuff, who kind of have that stuff sit there and get on and have a conversation and do things. So that's really important around guys. Uh, processing memory, there's some lovely piece of uh, PhD coming out of QUT at the moment. They did some males and females around um, re trauma responses. Um, and what they're finding around the processing is that, that some guys, that's important, like some women, but for some, it's not important at all. Because processing is often about managing effect. Yeah? So I could process it, but I could still have a shit life. Well, that's not going to be very good for me. So what they're saying is, for guys particularly, understanding that cognitive stuff, because they like that space, understanding what happened, understanding responsibility is more of a key thing for them. With women, what they're noting is a relational understanding of the relations, and the safety was about the different relationships. For guy, it's about allocating responsibility and understanding for themselves. Uh, it's also about integration, you know, uh, about actually getting a sense of self and understanding that all of us, in a sense, of, of uh, our communities, there is this no end point. There's no point of coming from what has been fractured to wholeness. All of us need help at different times. We all need skills in our toolbox about dealing with problems and assisting each other. And I think that quote down the bottom, it's, it's, it's from a, a great book, uh, 2012, I think, it came out of the US, uh, about uh, trauma recovery in context. It, it's the kind of almost guiding light of how we need to respond to those who have been sexually abused and sexually assaulted, saying, recovery and resilience do not reflect simply the absence of problematic symptoms, but rather a zest for life, a positive conceptualization of oneself, the ability to form positive, supportive, and safe relationships, and the ability to achieve a fulfilling quality of life. And that's the goal for all of us we live and work with around dealing with sexual abuse and sexual assault. Okay, that's it. I've got another slide, but I'll do that right at the end for you guys. Question. Sorry, I, I, we, well, I kind of got three days work into, you know, 30 minutes, didn't I? <laughs> Do you want to see the slide, or do you want to? <laughs> You've got to name. You've got to name these guys. Every single one of these guys has been sexually abused. Speaking about pornography, huh? Pornography. Is pornography. Yeah. Do you want me to say some words about pornography? Well, it's a really tricky one. One of the difficulties you've got to confront is, and Michael Flood did some nice work around this, was about how young males are accessing pornography now through uh, mobile phones, etc., and that it's much younger than women. So they're about 13, 14, they're starting to access it. We need to understand it in the context of men's culture. We know that some of the research from other countries are talking about some people using, males using pornography, a large, large amount, a huge percentage. So male culture sits within this. So also then, for guys who've been sexually abused, there's a sort of secrecy element here, isn't it? Because this is something we don't discuss much. So you can almost step into this space and start kind of getting into this space and trying to, and searching and spending time here. Uh, and, uh, and there's all the elements of sexual abuse. So I've got secrecy, I'm in a ro room alone, nobody else wants what I'm doing. It. You can get a high emotional charge. Yeah? But at the same time, often guys will go to this to try and work it out. And I'm not talking about offensive child pornography, but others. So they might work out the straight gay. I've still got this idea in my head around this. So some guys will try to use pornography as a way to manage that it managed this stuff and to try and work this stuff out. The difficulty with pornography is it's often, you know, it's about unequal relationships and, it's, and it doesn't really give you a whole sense of who it is. But working with it is really hard. What you often, do, one of the ways to work with it is talk to them about, you know, where that fits within their life, whether they'll be open and frank about that with their partners, whether they feel good before or after, whether they, because you know, one of the kicks around pornography is you get the thought about it and, and it's good stuff starts flowing through your head before you even go there. Yeah? So they get all the nice kick and then afterwards they feel crap 
usually. This is one of the trouble. So what you have to do is try and look at that and how that then can change your brain if you spend your time in that. And it's about how do then I put good images? How do I build good relationships? Sorry, that's a potted thing on pornography. Uh, yes, sorry. So I can name these, and David, you can name, help me with a couple of these. Um, some people will know around this, but I, I kind of want to acknowledge this, because there's men, we don't often hear the stories about men getting on with lives. And one of the things about these guys is that not all their lives have been great, but one of the things about it is also the fact is the reason why they're up here is because they have identities beyond sexual abuse. When people see them, they don't just see the victim of sexual abuse, they see men of courage who've gone forward because of the other achievements in their lives. In a sense, Men in our communities do that every day, but we validate them, and, and you know, in some ways the US has come forward much stronger. So we've got actually Harry O'Brien, um, AFL, so we acknowledge that, uh, who spoke about the struggles he'd had. Uh, we've got Greg Lamond, uh, we've got R.A. Dickey, who now plays in Canada, I think, he's a pitcher. Uh, we've got, any guys, can we get that next guy? Men? Sugar Ray Leonard, yeah, a boxer of decade. Um, he talked about, he just, he said when he went to the ring, he could just go to that place and it was like ice and cold. And he could go and fight because of that, because it was familiar to him. That's the scary part about this. Um, we've got Theo Fleury, we've got Ian Roberts, uh, you know, rugby league player. We've got Peter Jackson, rugby league player, sadly um, died. Um, uh, we've got Bishop Robinson, we've got Richard Dawkins, who uh, is the, um, what should we say, atheist. Um, we've got, uh, <laughs> we've got uh, Lawrence from Arabia, Arabia, we've got um, from CNN, no, the, the next, Jetton? Don, Don Lehman, who's anchor of CNN. Uh, we've got, Ron, uh, we've got uh, Stephen Fry, who, who now actually kind of questions this in a sense, doesn't see it as abuse for him, but was abused. Billy Connolly abused by his father. Carlos Santana, uh, Chris Brown. We've got Stan Walker, winner of um, Australian Idol. We uh, have Morrissey, for those Smiths fans amongst you. Uh, and uh, we have uh, Oprah. And the man there, third from the left, is Paolo Urquhart. He's from, uh, his family owns the Fiat company, three billion plus dollars worth, and he recently came out in the US. You know, one of our thoughts is if he puts just a little bit of his money into this, we could change the world. Thank you. <laughs>